This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Music plays a role in every single part of what I have ever done and what I will ever do and what I am doing now. Uh, it is inseparable from my work life, from my recreational life, from, from every, every aspect of it. There are instruments all over my house. There are two pianos, three guitars, a couple basses, a harmonium, you, you know, on and on. Um, I play it all the time. I listen to it all the time. And uh, it's, it's my food for, for every stage of, of my day and life. Wow. And when, when did you first start playing? Around uh, eight or 10, I have an older brother. So I was given his clarinet, which I was completely bummed about because uh, I did not want to play clarinet. But uh, since there was a clarinet in the house, I was told that that is what I was going to play. So I played that for a little while. I hated it every step of the way, but I was completely obsessed with music. So it wasn't until he brought home a guitar that he bought for, I think, $50 and decided not to play it. He just kept it under his bed and I would steal it in the middle of the day when he was out. And uh, I would try to learn it, try to figure out songs on it. So I was never formally trained, but it was just this uh, Pandora's box of, of different possibilities, uh, frustrations, but, but also um, a way of, of uh, incorporating some of the thoughts and feelings I had growing up into a different outlet, into a different medium. And so that guitar was a really important part of my growing up. And in terms of the, like the way that you play, was it along to records um, or, or like, you know, did you learn to read? Like what, what, what way of kind of teaching yourself um, did, you, did you stick to as you evolved? I learned to read a little bit while playing clarinet, but I wasn't, interested in in that level of musicianship i just wanted to play like other bands but it was really hard when you had no concept of even how to tune a guitar these were the times before electric tuners right so you had to tune by ear i didn't even know what that meant so i think the guitar was out of tune for for months and months and that made it even harder to try to pick out little notes from songs and mimic those notes on the guitar. Um, I remember I was listening to Echo and the Bunnymen a lot at that time. And I really wanted to play the guitar part to the rescue, such an iconic guitar part. And uh, I couldn't figure it out. And I think a lot of that had to do with not only my inability to play guitar, but also the fact that the guitar was just hopelessly out of tune. So even if I knew how to play, I, I doubt I would ever be able to play that riff. And in terms of, you know, your first choice here, uh, the Smiths, like, uh, why this album, Hatful of Hollow, is what, what you've put down? Um, and are, are you a big fan of the Smiths in general? Yeah, that's, uh, to, put, <laughs> to put it lightly, I, they were the one band that really opened up so many different uh, doors for me, artistically. Um, different ways of, of looking at the world. I know these are things that aren't usually associated with, with music or with albums, but they really, I can't uh, really underestimate the impact that they made on me. Uh, when I first heard them, my brother, again, uh, he was four years older, so he would be hip to all the cool new tunes. And you know, this was at the time when you basically had to choose between being a, a rocker or being into pop. So it was like, you know, Rat and Quiet Riot versus Kaja Gugu and, you know, Thompson Twins or something like that. So I was not exposed to music that threaded between these things. There was a lot of punk rock where I was growing up and I loved all that music. But it wasn't until I got a cassette tape of Mita's Murder. So it started with that and had this boombox in my bedroom. 
and it had one speaker on it. I would hold it up to my ear at, at night and put the covers over my head. And when I heard Headmaster Ritual and I heard these lyrics that I'd never heard any singer sing before in my life, I really, uh, it broadened my worldview uh, into a world that was a lot dirtier and crazier than the one I was growing up in, but also a lot more intriguing and, and honest. So my introduction to the Smiths was through Mita's murder. And then I quickly graduated. I saved up money as quickly as I could and bought the next album that was in the racks at the record store. And that was Hatful of Hollow, which I'm not sure how they even got. This was an import and it never released in the US. So I don't know how my local record store in Tustin, California got that, but they did. And it was everything that Mita's murder was, but you know, times 10 uh, <laughs> from lyrically, from the musicianship to the whole package. I just couldn't believe that a band had put together so many amazing songs that sounded so different from one another and just sort of effortlessly was just throwing these things out into the world. So after that album, you know, I was, I was sold and I thought that that was going to be something my, my obsession with the Smiths, with the lyrics, with the bass guitar riffs, with the drums, with the guitar. I thought that that would, you know, maybe I'd outgrow that after my teenage years, but I haven't, uh, you know, every time I listen to them, I learn something new. I still can't play some of Johnny Mars riffs. Uh, you know, I'm old now. I'm like, how the hell did he do that when he was 18? So uh, it's, it's an endless well of inspiration for me. Yeah, they, they have such a unique sound. Uh, do, you, do you follow their solo careers now, Johnny Marr and Morrissey? I tried to a little bit. Um, and I think they've got some interesting tunes. I just think that when they were together, there were all these different forces came, came together. You know, who knew that uh, a funk guitar bass player, a punk rock drummer, uh, you know, a vegan bipolar singer obsessed with Oscar Wilde would get together so well like that would possibly work if you jotted that down on graph paper you'd say these angles are all wrong this thing is never gonna jive but but somehow at that time uh within that space of what four or five years they were together i think the stars aligned mm -hmm. and there's something very special about those albums that can never be recreated that's not to say some of their solo stuff isn't isn't legit and interesting. Uh, I really like some of it, but there's just something uh, special. It's not got the, the, yeah. It's like the magic that kind of every great artist or band they have like a five year period more or less. I mean, yeah. it's not necessarily a golden rule because you do have people like I don't know Nick Cave or Dylan or just like people who continue to release like real like five star album after five star album. But I guess even then, you know, it's like that period where you can do no wrong. And and it's like just something in the air that you can't put your finger on, like why it's so brilliant. But it is. And the Smiths, like everything that they did was a bit like that because they were together for such a short time. Yeah. And I think it's the tension, you know, that tension can help fuel a band in different ways that can be really productive but you can only stay in that pressure cooker for so long, which is certainly mm. what happened with, with Johnny Marr. I mean, why would you leave the Smiths? They were just breaking, right? Just getting huge. And that's also a beautiful thing to be like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to leave this and, uh, and preserve what, what we've created. And they will never get back together. At least uh, I don't think they'll get back together. I was waiting for a long time. I think we were pretty close there for a while, but it's never going to happen. And there's something kind of great about that as well, because almost every single band gets back together and it's cool to see them live, but some of that spark is gone. Yeah. Well, it's very cool to see them live, but it's a bit like, it's a bit like what I'm imagining. I mean, I didn't go uh, to like the Led Zeppelin reunion at the O2, but I'm imagining the kind of rock and roll, uh, you know, the, the idyllic view of uh, such a reunion you had in your mind is like destroyed when you, you know, go up to the till to pay for your like prawn sandwiches and your lagers and you're charged like very corporate prices for them. And, you know, then you realize that this really is just all in the name of, of money, not in the name of artistry. Nothing wrong with doing stuff for profit, but it's just, 
it sucks the romance out of it when because they're always in these big corporate venues it's a bit like what going to see the stones has become it's all very i don't know yeah and you know there's also something special about having these albums having the way they sound <laughs> imagining things for so long in your mind you create your own universe Myths. of what this music is all about and then when you see it codified and sold to you, like I had the misfortune of seeing Fleetwood Mac on um, one of their latest tours. I'm a huge fan of the album Tusk, this crazy double album that no one seems to mm. really talk about. Everyone's talking about rumors. Um, the Tusk it was, outtakes. It was Tusk like, after rumors. Yes, it was the album like right 80. after rumors. It's so 1979. It's, I, I believe it's 1980. 1980 um, yeah. Uh, or maybe it was recorded in 79. It's, it's a really, a really like varied and interesting album. Such a weird album. Um, and when you hear their outtakes, like there's something so raw and perfect about that. And seeing them live, I mean, yeah, they got to fund their 401ks and, and all that. But uh, it was just step by step. I walk over here. I play this note. I walk back here. I play this note. There was nothing inspired or improvised about the whole thing. And to me, live music is, okay, you can control the atmosphere, the environment in a recorded um, facility. But when you're live, you have to integrate with the other band members integrate with what they're playing integrate with the response from the audience like it should feel more organic and i think so many bands just sort of press play on the on the dat deck and and mime along and uh that's that's a problem so the smiths never did that if you've seen them live they're just raw but it would have been know, before these uh, bands it would have been before like all this tech like where you go to a gig and it's like so flawless and it's just you know yeah. it's not properly live well there are very few artists who don't play to track apparently now yeah you know being out on the road that's how they make their money you know is being out on the roads they're they're not really making that much money on on albums anymore because of streaming services so hmm. you know that that's got to be you're spending two-thirds of your year on the road uh you know trying to make end meet uh ends meet at least you're showing up but uh the yeah usually when i see bands live now it's just you sound perfect that's the problem. Yeah. I want to hear the frets rattling on your guitar. You know, I want to hear you screwing up. Uh, yeah. I want to know that there's someone alive there and is, a is actually performing and, and playing. And that's getting harder and harder to find. Yeah, well, because if they're playing to the backing tracks, then it's it's taking something out of it. There are people who don't play, uh, but they're they're the kind of resolutely old school, or or so, there are some newer ones who who just have have the, the the requisite musicianship but it's few and far between uh, in terms of Fleetwood Mac did you see uh, pre Lindsay Buckingham or was that after he got booted out no no he was there and that was one of the main reasons it was the fall and Christy McVie was there and I thought wow this is a golden opportunity they're all back together this ain't gonna last yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Sure you know I'm not saying right. it was bad but it, it really was okay uh lights record even though they weren't playing along with tracks either everything was so prescribed uh that it really felt like they couldn't turn around and be like you know let's play never go back right now like to respond to what the audience yeah, was yeah. doing it's just like i'm gonna be here for two and a half hours and at two hours and 31 minutes i'm backstage i'm in my capsule see you later to the next gig and um I had wished I hadn't seen them because it really sullied my view of what I had created in my mind over so many decades of living with that music. When, when was the last time you saw a gig that it didn't feel like that? It's been a long time. I saw some guy called Bombino, uh, which is a, he's a Toreg guitarist. He's kind of like the Hendrix of the, you know, desert cultures. And uh, he blew me away. No, no backing tracks there. And it was a completely live experience. He can only do what he does live. So that was interesting. But I'll be honest, I don't see music too much anymore. I've been a little too slammed with work. And, and I hoped that when I had finished my book that I was going to be able to go out and see some bands and then COVID happened. So I'm excited to go out again and, mm. uh, and see what's out there. Well, the U S is, is, uh, by the looks of things, the gigs are coming back. I mean, I know they are a little bit in, in England, but like considering it's all just been lockdown has just been extended or, or not lockdown, but like 
restrictions that make gigs not possible have just been extended for another four weeks. So it'll probably be end of summer by the time the gigs come back. Yeah, it's everything's basically starting tomorrow. Everything's open. So no masks, no, no anything, which is a wonderful thing. Thanks, science. We'll get back into listening to music now, hopefully live. Yeah, it'll be incredible. Well, you've chosen a live album by Curtis Mayfield. Why did you choose? Uh, why did you choose a live album in, in particular? I had discovered that album about 12 years ago when I was starting to get burned out on on music. I just couldn't find anything that was inspiring. And I knew his his recorded stuff. He got Superfly. He got his first album. Amazing stuff. But, you know, it's Curtis in, in a studio. So there's a lot of strings. Um, I believe they were playing live through those. But uh, there's something about just that feeling, the emotion and the improvisation of live that has always really attracted me to to music, to seeing live music. So I found that album and it just sounded like these guys had rolled out of bed, grabbed whatever instrument was close by and just started riffing around. There's something so effortless and loose about that album. And I had played in bands, uh, punk rock bands or noise bands. And, you know, you rehearse the same song for six months, just trying to like really dial it in. You can tell these guys don't practice at all because they don't need to. They're just, each of them is naturally gifted. And when you get a group of naturally gifted musicians around like that, magic happens. And that album, they just sort of slip and slide through these songs. Someone will start off, uh, someone will catch up. You could tell they're never playing them the same way twice. And, you know, there's the lyrics, which are more prescient uh, now than they've ever been. Uh, he was a BLM guy be before that term ever existed. And so just the passion of it, how relaxed it is, how naturally in control they are with each and every aspect of, of each nuance of every song. Uh, I have probably listened to that album 2,000, 3,000 times. Everyone I know is so sick of hearing it because it fits <laughs> any situation, late night party, dinner party, hanging out, relaxing on the beach, you can put on Curtis Live and it grooves with no matter what's yeah, happening sure. around. Phenomenal uh, player, writer, singer, uh, yeah. Completely. I, do you think that there's been, because you talked about the kind of uh, social, uh, like cultural, uh, political aspect of it, uh, in terms of his songwriting, and 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 uh, same goes um, like similar time um, uh, as as Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On" album, and and like in general, just like a lot of really good uh, albums that you can still play today, and the message is like more relevant than ever and it and those records that like, really resonate uh have you heard much music that like new music that's been written considering that this is probably the most kind of turbulent time in the western world since i don't know like some people would say since since the world wars like has there been any kind of like artistry that's really encapsulated that that uh like they, there's those aching hearts that must be everywhere. I haven't heard it. Uh, I am so willing to listen to new music. I'm not one of those mm. people who's just sort of shored up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm happy with what I have. I don't want to hear. I'm so aching to hear mm. inspired new music. But man, I can't seem to find it. The, the closest thing I've found to something that's really inspired me, someone who's naturally talented is like, wise blood when i when i heard her and i heard that voice and i thought of karen carpenter and i thought that here's someone who came from a very religious upbringing there was a pain in her voice but also a lightness and humor that is truly original and truly inspired but i cannot find good new music <laughs> so somebody send me a mixtape please i would love to get it uh, because I'm, I'm desperate for some new tunes. Uh, I just have, I, I'm also extremely picky with, with what I like. I'm one of those people that 
when I find something I like, I'll listen to the album a thousand times in a row, over and over and over, understand every nuance, read every single thing in the album, read who it was produced by, read all the lyrics, copyright information, whatever. Um, so yeah, it takes a, nice a, a, a while to get into that. It, it takes a while for someone to really penetrate into that. But once they're in, they're in. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm looking listening i should say yeah there there is there is good new stuff but it's not like it doesn't pull you in as much i don't know why as as the extent to which you're talking you're talking about like where you're really doing a deep dive and, and and finding out all there is to know about the artist the story behind the record but then just just in terms of like if you wanted to think about what's going on in the world like you it, it says it all in my mind that you would just listen to Curtis Mayfield or Marvin Gaye. Like if you were producing like a program about what's going on in the world, you'd put on those records. You wouldn't put on like the pro there. Cause there have been some protest songs that I've listened to, I've, you know, I'm not going to name and shame them, you know, but uh, not shame them. I mean, maybe some people think they're good, but there, there've been some pretty shit like protest songs uh, done in and done, done for all the right reasons, but like, then just the music and the lyricism doesn't cut cut it. Um, Dude, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm not saying these people aren't genuine and, you know, they're wearing their heart on their sleeve. They're saying something important. That's great. But it just doesn't seem like it's been articulated in, in this simple and yet subtle and sophisticated way that Curtis was able to just being completely straight up with what was happening. And at the same time, having a groove to your message, which no one can match, right? Mm. This guy was able to uncover rhythms and nuances in his music that uh, I just don't think it can be matched by a drum machine. Um, you mm. know, Master Henry Gibson's ghost notes, just throwing those out like Halloween candy. You can't do that with a drum machine. Um, it's, there's on another level and that, that level of, of having a human behind this stuff gives it more emotional heft in my opinion what do you think about the idea that they're inventing uh, uh you know artificial intelligence that's going to be able to do like uh, you know uh, the, those ghost notes or uh, a guitar solo by like steve lucifer or, or write songs like john lennon or what, whatever like they and they're going to be able to do it better than humans uh, is, is that something that that is pot conceivable I think maybe in like a thousand years or something, it, it might be conceivable, but it's, it's not mimicking the notes or mimicking the, the beats. It's trying to mimic the humor and the wit. I mean, the second AI starts writing lyrics of belligerent ghouls run Manchester schools, spineless swine, cemented lines, you, you know, it's there, there's such a, a deeper depth to the humor and emotion behind good lyrics that AI can rhyme, no problem, but I don't think it can really get to the crux of the human experience. Uh, all the AI I've seen that have been writing books and have been writing newspaper articles, it's terrible. It's, it's so far away from anything close to being entertaining or tolerable that we've got a long way to go. Well, that's kind of good to hear, to be honest. Uh, but but not that good to hear, I will caveat, because you're saying like, oh, well, the lyrics won't be that good. Um, and like, so therefore, you know, that will kind of kill that momentarily and it's gonna take a thousand years. But what do you make of uh, my theory that like, even if the lyrics are a bit crap, like they'll they'll like mine these artificial intelligence, they'll use this tech and like, even if the lyrics are crap, like people will like it anyway, because I don't know, like I feel like lyricism's getting a lot worse as it is anyway, like in the mainstream anyway. They're already doing that. I mean, maybe not with computers, but they're saying this song sold X amount. It was two and a half minutes long. It had this BPM. It had this type of female singer. Listen to the radio now. And mm. they've been calculating that formula for so long. But what happened is, and what's so sad is that formula has been set for, for a while, for decades. 
what's a hit? Okay, here's the formula. You, you know, it's, it's like writing a screenplay. There's just this act one, two, and three formula, and you follow that, there's your screenplay. But what's scary is that they started mining indie music and punk music and all of these different forms of music that was counter to all of that. It was uh, a rebelling against this formulaic music. Now that stuff's being canned and commodified, which is scary. You know, you see mm. some some pop star boy band wearing a Joy Division t-shirt has no idea who that band is, but someone's done the research that found, hey, that's what the cool people wear, you know? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's maybe that's just me being old and, and crankier now. No, um, I think but, there are a lot of young people who would agree with that. Yeah. There are no, there are no, uh, or there are very few, uh, like, um, symbol like figures uh kind of pushing back against the com commodification of, of uh pop music it's just all manufactured crap and that that point about the joy division t-shirt really sums it up it's like even when you when it's like marketed quite well so that you think that it's like a really cool rebellious person like they're just they're not like and a lot of the time it feels like uh, the music today is marketed with these kind of like it is really good for example when Curtis Mayfield comes out at, at, like and writes music with with a point behind it and even with the impressions like tracks that people get ready like they they're proper civil rights songs but like now it feels like people serve up the music with a dose of uh, a dose of some some sort of story like some voyage of personal self-discovery or something like like there's never just the music served up now. There's always some sort of like, in my view, quite pointless narrative along with it. I just think there has to be because they're marketing music in a different way. People are buying music in a different way, you know. Uh, They've got to stand out. Social media, yeah, you know, it's like power to the people, buy my new album. And that, <laughs> that's that's basically what's what's happened. And, you know, I know that there's some genuine people out there with a genuinely original message who have true natural talent, I just can't seem to find them. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm listening, and, and hopefully I'll stumble upon. I do think, I, I, I don't know whether you've heard Anderson Pack. like his, his music's pretty, pretty good. He's a very good drummer as well. Uh, okay. Like he's actually in the charts. I mean, it, it's, it is more like a lot of it is hip hop. Um, mm -hmm hip hop, uh, but uh, like uh, he does a lot of R&B, sings well, he raps, but he's also a drummer. He plays and sings at the same time. Hmm. Um, like some of his new stuff is quite manufactured, but it's not really like, it's not manufactured in the sense of, uh, it's, it sounds like old school pastiche manufactured. Like he's an intelligent hmm. guy, an intelligent player, really good musician. Uh, and so they released, he, he, he released some like throwback 70s stuff, but it's real, it's that real drum sound anyway, that was really refreshing to hear because it's a bit all over the top 40 radio at the moment. Hmm. And to just hear a snare drum was like a mic <laughs> snare drum. Was, yeah. It was, it was really like, oh my God, this sounds amazing. I was thinking the other day about just how incredible uh, all those 60s records with really small drums sound, which kind of brings me on to Sid Barrett. Um, the Mad Cat laughs and Sid Barrett, uh, such a fascinating character and like no one need an introduction to, to, to who he is, who listens to this podcast. But why would you choose The Mad Cat Laughs as one of your favorite albums? I think that, you know, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, at the time when I first discovered that, I was 18 or 19, uh, it was a little noisy to me. Songs were a little long. They were a little disjointed. I like things in a cleaner package back then. And I like Sid's songs. I like the gnome. I like a few of his songs, but I could never really latch on to what he was saying or why. I was just like, this guy's so high. He's talking about he's built this whole story about this gnome and this forest and it's wonderful and they're they're sharing tea and 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 eating crumpets it's like that's great but it didn't strike me emotionally and then when I heard Madcap laughs a friend loaned me that album it was like you were listening to this crack in in reality on like one side 
he was still in the physical world. And on the other side, he was so far gone into the imaginary world. And we all know what was happening at that time. He was going crazy. He was, he was literally going insane. And so that album, more than any others, uh, more than a Van Gogh painting or, or, or whatever, is able to balance between these two worlds of, of insanity, of a fantasy land, a world constructed entirely of your imagination and a world that still has chords in its music and still has melody and something that Sid was so incredible at doing, at writing songs. And he just let his imagination go free on his solo stuff. I had heard that he wrote all the songs in three days. Uh, he can't make it through the songs if you listen to the album. Side two is he cannot make it through these songs. And yet that delicateness and that, that fragility to the songs has such an emotional heft to it. Even when he's singing nonsense, he's singing it from his heart. You know, this is, this is him telling you like it is what's happening in his world. And then he caps it off with, with late night, you know, one of his most beautiful song, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful songs there is. And you say, wow, He's just going to drift off into the, in the into the vapor now, and which is exactly what he did. His album after that, Barrett, much harder to listen to. It's too far gone, but this one is is just on the edge, and I think that that is something that can never be recreated again. Uh, yeah, that's so poignant. Uh, it's so rare that you find like that kind of marriage between knowing the sto- like really intimately knowing the story of what someone was going through uh, and then having like the art to go with it, the music to go with it that, that resonates with you as well. But like, but um, and it's very rare to have, uh, to know that something so crazy was going on, like, you know, him actually going crazy. Uh, it's quite rare to, to, to know of a story. Like it's such a unique story, the Sid Barrett story. And like, so to have that, like as you were saying, it's like more than, more so than Van Gogh. It's got that poignancy to it. Uh, yeah, uh, it's 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 really remarkable. Like listening to the Sid Barrett stuff. Uh, but he only passed away quite recently, didn't he? He did, but he never did anything after those no. albums. You know that that window for him opened, and it opened so wide, and then it slammed shut, and he was he was done. Uh, you know, shine on you crazy diamond famous Floyd song about him is when he came Mm. to their studio and he was like 300 pounds and nobody noticed him. They said, what's this guy doing? And then, you know, Roger Waters was like, Oh my God, that's, that's Sid. Uh, And he was just completely gone. So that other people have tried to tried to feign his, that you know the, the glory of the rock and roller who's right on the edge i'm kind of crazy i'm moody but no one's done it genuinely and maybe uh, you know musicians have gone crazy maybe that has happened they've gone insane but they didn't have this wealth of talent that sid brought to it so he could convey what it was like to step into that other world that other way of being which he then spent the rest of his life in and did you were you did you did you uh, stay a Pink Floyd fan? You know, like throughout everything. Sure, I did. You know, uh, and they've got great albums, and uh, the post Sid stuff is great. Their their early seventies stuff, all the classic yeah. Dark Side. It's all amazing stuff. You know, it's it's been so overplayed. Everyone's heard it so much. Like, oh, yeah, God, yeah. don't put Breathe on again, please. No, but if if you step back a bit and think of where they were, how they put those albums together, they're pure magic. They they really were. They still no one has ever sounded like them since. It's as hard as people have tried. They are a true original. You hear two seconds of them, you say. That's Pink Floyd. You hear two seconds of the Smiths, you're like, that can only be the Smiths. You hear Sid, this is, this is the same thing. Only Sid can write this song. And that's special and so hard to do. Very, very true. 
and another thing uh, that's sadly lacking uh, a lot these days. But it is bloody hard because it has a lot of it has been done before, and then you've got the tech problem. And the problem of like actually trying to put food on the table, uh, which people have to grapple with, like to what extent do you sell your soul uh, to to be able to fit in on the radio? But yeah, those those acts, and and that I guess you know you could list list quite quite a number of them uh, from eras gone by, where literally you could no one could recreate that other than that individual or or, or that group. Um, uh, different. But equally brilliant. What about felt poem of the river? So I had been listening to the felt for a while when I discovered that album. I was in my early twenties, and I always liked them. I never loved them. Uh, they were something I, I put on. I enjoyed their music. Some of his lyrics are pretty funny. All the people I like are those who are dead. That's that's pretty good, right? You got me with that. Okay, I'm going to listen to your albums. And when I found poem of the river, I was at the college radio station and I had this very late shift because I was new there and of course they give you the the 1 a.m to 3 a.m shift and I was always looking for long songs I could play so I could go out and have a cigarette <laughs> I was I was smoked at that time and I found this album I was like oh the felt they're they're cool the album cover looked looked nice I found the song that was nine minutes long. I said, ha ha, I'm just going to play that instead of playing Lou Reed's uh, metal machine music, you know, and really pissing people off. And so I kept playing the song every time, every week, um, writing the equator. It's this nine minute long song. And it really started to weave its way into my brain. And then I started to understand the rest of the album. And this is an album that was all recorded live because they were this art rock band that were also a jam band. And those two things, you know, you think, well, that sounds like an awful idea. You've got like Grateful Dead jam bands, Fish jam bands. Then you've got art rock, you know, and, and it's usually two minute pop songs. But they were able, because of their musicianship, to bring these two things together. And I am still so blown away by that album and by what these guys were able to do with an organ, a guitar, a bass, and, and a great drummer. And just how they were able to weave in between each other's lines and create this, this color and this fullness in these songs. And these songs also, they don't have an overt attention. They don't have these huge crescendos, but every one of them very lightly opens up as it goes. So it really feels like you're taking a big breath of air that, that that's lasting nine minutes long. It's like an inhale, a nine minute long inhale if you're talking writing the equator. And it just turned out to be one of those albums I go back to over and over and over. And I'm I'm stunned that more people don't don't recognize how awesome it is and mm. also um haven't don't discover it. I mean it's it's there waiting to be discovered. And I, I think it's really special. It's really well, you, special. you don't actually hear about felt uh, that often, but they were seriously influential on a bunch of, I guess, you know, better known bands like the Charlatans or uh, Mannix, um, Bell and Sebastian, uh, just like that kind of, I guess you'd call it alt rock. Um, yeah. So I guess, I, I mean, because when did they split up felt? They split up after two albums after that. And their last album I don't like very much. It's you could tell they were just trying to they're tired of playing to rooms with 30 people, not not having money to, to pay rent. You know, they were around for 10 years. They released an album every year for 10 years, which is which is also pretty great. So and then he went Lawrence went on and, and started a denim, some glam rock band, which was just pretty, pretty vapid in my opinion. There was none of the humor, none of the, the depth, and none of the musicianship that, that was on these Felt albums. The organist went to play with Primal Scream because he's just like a freaking wizard. But, but these guys really understood their instruments. And especially when you're in indie rock, you know, some bands learn three chords and they're like, oh, it's a novelty that we kind of sound like crap. That's good because we don't want to sound too slick. But Felt sounded like they really knew their stuff and they knew what to put and where to put it. 
And I was just listening to that album on, on headphones walking around here in San Francisco where I live. And it was just really transcendent. I think it's just such a, a beautiful album. And again, a bit of a crime that uh, it's not more well uh, regarded or, or discovered by more people. Yeah, yeah, I know, I agree. But it's uh, it's so difficult. There's such an abundance of content out there these days that, you know, to find stuff that's not been like lost totally, but like been somewhat overlooked from the past, unless you've got like a promo team. I bet there's so many great records from the 60s and 70s that aren't even on Spotify. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I have a 78 player. I, we, my wife and I picked it up in Argentina. And it's interesting listening to those albums because 90% of that stuff never made it on to 33 and a third, right? It's just, it's lost music. And so you can put on a song and you're like, no one else in the world is listening to this now. This song's totally forgotten. Then you think about the person recording this thing in the 1920s you know, singing into a little microphone, probably in a basement studio. And what a strange thing it is that a hundred years later, here we are listening to this, this music. Uh, so it still lives on in this odd way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in terms of uh, like classical music, how big are you on that? Cause you put down Carl Nielsen symphony number no. five. So, yeah, I had to, because I'm not a classical music nut. I just about 15 years ago, I love music so much, but I could not find pop music. I couldn't find rock music that was really hitting home for me. And again, I am picky, but I'm also open-minded. I don't care what genre it's in. If it's legit, it's legit. So you can listen to jazz. You can listen to piano music. If it's, if it's got the soul, if, if, it's, if it's got the beat, uh, then it's good. So I, on a whim... I was complaining to some friends and they're like, shut up. Uh, why don't you buy symphony tickets? There's a lot of good stuff out there. I said, wow, here's, here's a genre of music I don't really know anything about. Uh, I didn't grow up with Beethoven or Bach or any of that. So I bought symphony tickets where I thought it's going to force me, you know, every week or every week and a half to go to the symphony and to really focus on music. I'm not going to be able to to be looking at my phone. I'm just going to be sitting there in a chair listening. And most of it was a disappointment. You know, it sounded like carousel music or marionette music or, or something. I just was not into it. I respect that at the time it was revolutionary, but it wasn't speaking to me in, until I heard this guy, Carl Nielsen, who was writing a bunch of music in the 20s, 1910s and 20s. And it was the most modernist, spooky, dark, inspiring piece of music I have arguably ever heard. Um, I did not understand someone could do what he does with, with an orchestra to elicit such emotions and at the same time elicit such, such an energy from the crowd. And I went back and saw that piece about three times. And every time more than half the crowd was, was just bawling at the end of it, uh, I was among them because it was just such this, this powerful thing. What I like about it is it's so different from any classical music. It sounds so modern. And I think that's part of the initial appeal for me. That's really interesting. You've spoken a couple of times as well of, of uh, you know, having those moments where you can't, where you've almost been musicked out and you like, you can't really find anything that's, that's hitting home. And but yeah, it's kind of comforting to hear because you know you've spoken with such passion about music you're clearly a big music fan it's kind of comforting to hear that other big music fans do go through that i think everybody does it's like just sometimes you're not feeling it doesn't mean you don't love it yeah and then you just kind of go back to the old classics right you go back to your old favorites and you just further your your love and interest in those but doing that's great it's a fun thing to reminisce but it also starts solidifying you in this corner right here's what i like here's what i comfortable what i'm comfortable with and luckily you know for the last several decades i've accumulated bands i'm just so passionate about and i can go back to them anytime they always have something to give but classical music is is thornier for me because uh it's hard for me to find the stuff that really truly resonates. But once I find it, 
I really glom onto it. So luckily there's so much of it, right? Uh, that you can really explore and go deep. And it's fun to, to dig through that and to listen to it and try to find new stuff that inspires you. And I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for share, sharing a, like a snapshot of your musical taste um, with us on the podcast. But I wanted to talk a bit about your book to, to finish off, like, well, your latest book uh, anyway, uh, particularly as it's uh, it's quite relevant to me right now. I'm, I don't know whether it's hay fever because I'm currently in Portugal and I was in the UK, hmm. but I'm struggling uh, to breathe quite a lot. Uh, so I wanted to... Uh, talk a little bit about your book because a, a lot of people uh, who listen to this podcast would be extremely interested to read it. I mean, anyone who, you know, is capable of showing interest in anything would be interested in this, uh, in this topic. Um, so what, why, why did you decide to write a book about breathing? Yeah, I never set out to do this. I've been a science journalist for a long time, but it was a number of things kept happening um, where I realized there was a larger story here to be told. And I think that one of the jumping off points for me was to discover these free divers. I was set, sent out on assignment by Outside Magazine, big magazine out here in the US, to write about free diving, which is this sport in which you hold your breath for four, five, six, seven minutes at a time and dive to these incredible depths. None of this should be possible, right? It, it should be scientifically impossible for the human body to do this. And yet, are these people doing this thing? So once I learned about that, I thought, where else can breathing take us? And after that, I learned that the vast majority of the human population uh, struggles to breathe. Um, we've struggled to breathe because we our, our anatomy has changed. Our mouths are too small now. Our ancestors didn't have these problems. No other animal has them except for modern humans. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? This seems like uh, this book on breathing just got, um, or the subject matter got a lot more intriguing and weird. And uh, that's when I fell into it. And it's interesting because uh, just to tie music into writing this book, I listen to music a lot when I'm writing. And this, this book was written to the peaks and valleys of uh, The Queen is Dead. So uh, I, it has 10 <laughs> chapters, that album has 10 songs. And I love that. That's not my favorite album of theirs, but I love the flow of that album. There's a real poppy song. And then there's kind of a bummer song, a slow song. And then there's a poppier song, then a really fast song. And I thought, wow, what would it be right? What would it be like to, to write a book that had that same arc, you know, that had those, those uh, peaks and valleys. And, and so that's, I've never told anyone this. So uh, there it is. You can listen to Queen is Dead and, and read that book and, uh, find the parallels for yourself i mean the 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 subject uh like this book has been been a real kind of feels like it's been a real life-changing uh thing for so many people like a bit like uh there was there was the book on sleep um that, that my dad and my girlfriend read uh and uh i mean sadly i haven't actually read it because uh, what I got out of it was that you need to sleep eight hours a night and now we're on a, uh, and I love it, we're on a relentless schedule of eight hours a night, uh, every night without fail and has been for years now. And it's extremely good for you. I feel like that this, your book has had that kind of same resonance, like life-changing resonance for people. Has that, is that something that's brought you a, a lot of joy? I mean, you mentioned doing 200 podcasts, but has the promotional treadmill, uh, been uh, it sounds like it's been quite intense can't say how happy i was to to get a podcast request to talk about music so <laughs> so uh, this one i've been really excited about but it's been totally intense but at the same time you spend four or five years alone and i build a shed in my backyard where i just write and i don't really talk to people too much unless i'm interviewing them and you're in this real hole right and I love it being in that hole. It's, it's a hole of your own creation. You create your own universe when, when you're writing a, a book um, mm. and you control that universe. And then you have to go outside and you're like, oh, I have to interact with people. So um, it's been fun uh, actually to, to go out into the light again and talk with people. And this is a subject I'm so passionate about and I've received thousands of letters for from people who've you know really benefited from from this knowledge and some of the practices and in some cases it's totally changed their life uh because the sad fact is uh we've been lied to uh 
about a lot of this stuff, just like we've been lied to about what good nutrition is. You know, eat, eat a bunch of wheat, eat a bunch of grains, you're going to be okay. Look at society right now, how sick we are. And so that's been inspiring. It's been inspiring to, to start talking and working with research at some top institutions on some different breathing experiments and, and more scientific research. So it's been exhausting, totally exhausting. Music helps buoy my, my mood, you know, a lot. And that's been helpful. But it's also a, a complete pleasure to be able to communicate this information uh, out into the world. Uh, it's, it's helped me tremendously when I learned these, these little tricks from the, the research uh, scientists. And uh, it's great to, to see other people benefit from that as well. That's really the highest compliment. You sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.